kind of them. Mm -hmm. And we are going to be live on YouTube. Oh, there's Jordan. Good. Good. We have another sidekick here. Okay. And it appears that we are now. Wait a minute. I have to correct one thing in my sound system. This keeps happening to me. Okay. Now I should be all right. Hey, Jordan. I... You're muted, Jordan. Yeah, we can't hear you, Jordan. Uh, so good evening, everyone in YouTube land. And uh, we are tonight going to begin the second essay in uh, volume seven of the collected works of uh, C.G. Young, which is two essays on analytical psychology. And so last week we completed uh, essay one, which is about 45% of the book. Now we have essay two to face. And uh, I think it's probably about the same length, more or less, because there's all obviously a index and that sort of thing. And um, high big brain content and Lamont. <laughs> okay, so I, what I was gonna ask uh, was, uh, Jewel, was whether you're able to follow the YouTube chat. Um, I can pull it up on another computer because I think I was one of the things in the background earlier, the feed, the mystery, right. I think as I was learning some stuff, I'm not going to turn the sound on. And that's right. where there is. Let me know it. My speakers may pick it up. That's what I'm thinking. So, yeah. um, so anyway, I'm going go <laughs> to go back. Okay. Well, we're getting there. Good evening, Art. Nice to see you. Happy Valentine's day. Thank you for that. Uh, box of chocolates i wish we could have some <laughs> but anyway we're going to move on uh and justin is here happy valentine's day to everybody and um so what i'm going to do with jordan first here is i'm going to go ahead and i'm going to read the uh, preface of the of the second edition which is what we have here which becomes the second and third edition. And um, then we'll go into the actual paragraph. So here's, here's what Dr. Jung says as his preface, written in 1935, by the way. This little book is the outcome of a lecture, which was originally published in 1916 under the title Le Structure de l'Inconscient of the unconscious, I guess, in French. Uh, this same lecture later appeared in English under the title, The Conception of the Unconscious. And in my collected papers on analytical psychology, I mentioned these facts because I wish to place it on the record that the present essay is not making its first appearance, but it is rather the expression of a long-standing endeavor to grasp and at least in its essential features, to depict the strange character and course of that dream interior, the transformation process of the unconscious psyche. This idea of the independence of the unconscious, which distinguishes my views so radically from those of Freud, came to me as far back as 1902, when I was engaged in studying the psychic history of a young girl sonambulist. In a lecture given in Zurich in 1908 on, quote, the content of the psychoses, I approached this idea from another side. In 1912, I illustrated some of the main points of the process in an individual case. And at the same time, I indicated the historical and ethnological parallels to these seemingly universal psychic events. In the above mentioned essay, La Structure de l'Inconscient, uh, the French version, I attempted for the first time to give a comprehensive account of the whole process. It was a mere attempt of whose inadequacy I was painfully aware. Uh, the difficulties presented by the material were so great 
that I could not hope to do them anything like justice in a single essay. I therefore let it rest at this at the stage of an interim report with the firm intention of returning to this theme at a later opportunity. 12 years of further experience enabled me in 1928 to undertake a thorough revision of my formulations of 1916. And the result of these labors was the little book, De Bezi Hungren. I'm not going to read the German title. Uh, maybe I'll give it a try just for laughs. Zwischen dem Ich und dem Unbewassten. Okay, never mind. That was bad. And uh, so, anyway, it's titled. That's Symbols of Transformation. Yeah, uh, right. And uh, anyway. Uh, this time I tried to describe chiefly the relation of the ego consciousness to the unconscious process. Following this intention, I concern myself more particularly with those phenomena which are to be regarded as the reactive symptoms of the conscious personality to the influences of the unconscious. In this way, I tried to affect an indirect approach to the unconscious process itself. These investigations have not yet come to a satisfactory conclusion. No consciousness to the unconscious. Uh, for process. the following this intention, I is, more particularly with those uh, phenomena which are to be regarded as the reactive symptoms um, of conscious personality to the influences of the unconscious. So, the someone is playing an indirect approach you to. Um, out in the room. Is that you, Annabelle? <laughs> Good evening. Hi. Good evening. Okay. I think we're okay now. Uh, let's see. Wow. And, and Justin has given us some goodies on YouTube, including cherries, an ice cream cone, a lollipop, a chocolate chip cookie, a cupcake, a piece of cake, and a piece of candy. Oh, and, and, and <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day, Justin. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, the imaginal world lives. Okay, so anyway, going on. I would not venture upon this exceedingly difficult task without the fullest possible experience. Its solution is reserved for the future. I trust the reader of this book will bear with me if I beg him to regard it, should he persevere, as an earnest attempt on my part to form an intellectual conception of a new and hitherto unexplored field of experience. It is not concerned with a clever system of thought, but with the formulation of complex psychic experiences, which have never yet been the subject of scientific study. Since the psyche is an irrational datum and cannot, in accordance with the old picture, be equated with a more or less divine reason, it should not surprise us if in the course of psychological experience, we come across with extreme frequency process, processes and happenings which run counter to our rational expectations and are therefore rejected by the rationalistic oh, attitude of our conscious mind. Um, such an attitude is naturally not very skilled at psychological observation because it is in the highest degree unscientific. We must not attempt to tell nature what to do if we want to observe her operations undisturbed. It is 28 years of psychological and psychiatric experience that I am trying to sum up here. So perhaps my little book may, uh, may lay some claim to serious consideration. Naturally, I could not say any, everything in this single exposition. The reader will find a development of the last chapter, which reference to the concept of the self in my commentary on the secret of the golden flower, the book I brought out in collaboration with my friend Richard Wilhelm. I did not wish to omit reference to this publication because Oriental philosophy 
has been concerned with this interior psychic processes for many hundreds of years and is therefore in view of the great need for comparative material of inestimable, inestimable value in psychological research, October 1934. Then in 1938, he adds this to the third edition. The new, this new edition is published without changes since this work first appeared. No new points of view have emerged which might have made revisions desirable. I would like to preserve the character of this little book and unpretentious, an unpretentious introduction to the psychological problems of the process of individuation and not burden it with copious details that might limit its readability, April 1938. So this brilliant put all put together uh, thesis that he puts out comes out one year before the beginning of World War II in Europe. And so therefore nobody pays much attention to it for, for the next decade, I suspect. <laughs> okay and what, was... what am i thinking of that's if in the course of human events no when in the course of human events yes. yeah. <laughs> that sounds like all this work that jung is doing is when in the course of human events <laughs> a brilliant mind appears yeah. and uh and kind of sees through it right mm -hmm. or sees yeah hopefully in out writes, in around all you know <laughs> inside out and hopefully writes it all down right yes and uh, and so we were having a very interesting conversation on sunday morning uh with our friend uh, neil from uh brazil and we were talking about the need to go back and reevaluate all historical periods from a psychological point of view yes. um, because it's only the psyche that gets us into wars and you know into dynasties and that sort of thing nothing else yeah. and so uh, up till now historians haven't understood that so they just keep track of oh this happened that here, then then this happens then and mm -hmm. um without any real analysis, which is a very superficial way of going at it. And um, it's what, uh, you know, the way I got it when I was in college, I was a history major. And, you know, it was basically just, you know, so-and-so did this and so-and-so did that. And, you know, they wanted to be the king or the emperor, or what, what have you. And um, so, uh, I'm sorry, folks, on the YouTube channel, uh, I am removing obvious trolls immediately. Uh, without... Re reading about Iceland in advance of going there, there's really a wonderful um, contrast that's a developing because on the one hand, there are all these sagas of these Vikings and they show up and they just murder people left, right and center and somebody stole his cow so he murdered the entire village and that kind of thing. But the history of Iceland in quote unquote modern times and I don't, I'm not familiar enough with it yet if I ever will be, but they have been in no wars. They're not, they have no army. They don't send anybody anywhere for any right. of these wars that we right. can, I mean, if you just talk about from, you know, randomly, you know, the, those wars that Teddy Roosevelt was in or, you know, anything from, you know, the end of, well, let's say post American Civil War, right? Po yeah. Post 1870, yeah. because I think that's an important time period to think about. And <laughs> I'm doing a lot of study or, around yeah. transcendentalists. It's, um, you know, you have the industrial revolution and then you can mass produce all these weapons. And I think that's, a, I mean, you could mass produce sewing machines and you could invent washing machines and you could build all these things, but you also could make weapons and then all these wonderful armies could just go out there, you know. Anyway. Okay, we well, have that's a, a great point with Iceland. 
yeah. Annabelle, because also the the anti military strategy of consciously yeah. naming Iceland and Greenland was yeah. that Iceland was the gym. So they yeah. so they named it Iceland, and they named Greenland was the barren ice wasteland that no one wanted to survive in, and they named wow. it Greenland. So when everyone went to invade quote unquote the Iceland, they were going to Greenland. Yeah. And it was because the name looked attractive, but it just they just they didn't have to fight back. They go to yeah. Greenland, they die, or they'd have yeah. to leave and return home. And right. then Iceland, just by its name, cloaked yeah. itself. Yeah. 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 <laughs> do you want to go to Iceland? <laughs> yeah, it's like no. Does anybody want to go to Iceland? Oh boy. Well, I, I'm I going. Do. I mean, oh. I don't know if yes. I would have chosen it, but I'm amazed how many people I know have been there. You know, when yeah, I say, oh, I'm going, I say, oh, we've been there. I'm like, why? <laughs> well, well, my sister went there several years ago with her family, and she Everybody said goes. scuba diving was one of the most wonderful experiences because you could literally reach out and touch two different continents, two okay. tectonic plates exactly. that were different land masses. And that's pretty, that's pretty cool. That's more than just borderland, you know? Yeah. And that's part of the, um, you know, the healing waters and all, because I travel for healing waters to mm. many places, including Ojo Caliente. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I would be going to Iceland anyway, you know, in my imaginary. How long are you going world. for? Uh, kind of about 10 days. 10 days. I'm leaving Thursday. Mm, okay, cool. so we're going to miss you for two weeks, probably, huh? I think you'll have me that next right after I get back. That's right uh -huh. when I get back. I think I'll show up, but I yeah. may be a little. Yeah, like, it'll be a over. bright okay, well, screen. We have, we have so an opportunity illuminate. for you. We have an opportunity for you'll you. You'll be glowing. For, for <laughs> sacred waters, which is uh, we're going to begin our confluence this summer by going to a spring, which is at the Continental Divide. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has go. waters going both east and west yeah. and uh, we're going to take waters from the continental divide and uh, open our conference our confluence with that mm -hmm. and so i want to divert di uh, <laughs> divest diverge return for a minute huh? <laughs> Oh, what, you don't want to return. <laughs> you don't want to return. Well, I do. I will return shortly, but I want to have, answer a question here from Re Rebecca Marie. Okay. Uh, she says, "I see a lot of spirituality in Jung's work, but I am, uh, but I am a spiritual person. So I would. Uh, let's see. Wait a minute. I, that was her second thing. I think she said, out of the blue, question: Do you?" see spirituality in psychology a lot of people look at things as one or the one uh the other without seeing an overlap uh, i'm intrigued in all of your perspectives well thank you rebecca and uh of course everybody that's been listening to me recently knows that uh i do uh see a lot of spirituality in uh in, in psychology and uh, I think that we've sort of gotten to the bottom of it, which is to say that uh, all religions, Jungian psychology, art, um, and a couple of other disciplines, education maybe, um, they all point to the same thing, which is the unconscious, and they point to ways of opening the unconscious. And the essence of Jung's work, and actually the essence of all these activities is to open the unconscious because it is the healing power to our psyches. And uh, we have been working now for uh, nine months on putting together a confluence of these ideas in um, Helena, Montana this summer, June the 10th to the 14th. And this started uh, last May when I was, when I visited uh, Tim Holmes, who's one of our colleagues on the advanced reading group. And um, I suggested it to him. And by November, we had gathered a team of six individuals 
one of whom is a psychiatrist, one is a psychologist, one is a poet, um, one is a business executive, and that's me. Uh, and my art is uh, creating businesses out of nothing. Um, and uh, and uh, Colleen Kiber, who's uh, a very accomplished uh, sculptress on the West Coast, and we went to her home. Uh, she lives in a beautiful home right on, on the cliff overlooking the Pacific Ocean uh, near Santa Cruz, California. And we spent a weekend with her. And in the course of it, we were discussing what we will do next June. But what we found was that we were already in the confluence, that we had already, but just by talking about it, we had opened our unconscious to the stream of energy that comes out and it heals us. And so when the six of us left that event uh, last November, we already, we already realized that, oh my God, we are, the, this isn't a one-off deal that we're going to do next summer and, you know, do that and then it's over. No, we, we actually started it um, when we started to talk to those other people last summer. And uh, it was really flowing in earnest when we were together in November. And so what we're doing is inviting um, 30 people, only 30. So you have to write to us and tell us if you want to attend. It's going to be a very unique event. It's, it's, uh, it's artsy, but it's not specifically about art. It's about healing and, um, and exactly that, a spiritual aspect of psychology, but a spiritual aspect of art and a spiritual aspect of religion. And so it's going to be a very, very powerful event. And the people that uh, it's by invitation only. So you have to let us know that you want to come and, and then tell us a little bit about yourself. And uh, we think that we already pulled uh, uh, six 10,000 volt power lines together for a weekend and braided them together. And whoa, did we feel energy? Well, if we bring those same six together, plus 30 others that we know to be um, uh, very spiritual people, um, then we're going to have an amazing experience, no doubt about it. And uh, so, yes, <laughs> the short answer to your question, Rebecca, is that Jung's psychology is all about spirituality and religion entirely. Um, and I would add too that Jung's psychology is a life affirming spirituality rather than just being realist or life affirming. It's both. And it's both rather than chefs. If we see an intersection, I see them as both and um, that they work together. So I, I think that's an excellent question. And um, personally, I feel that they're over, not just intersected. I think they're dancing together. Right. And uh, so. And I'll are, agree to that. And right. I did not understand that until I got deeper into Carl Jung. As some of y'all know, the only, and I didn't grow up in a church. The only thing I knew about spirits was maybe heard that coming into that. And then whatever superstitions that were out there and by coming into Carl Jung and some other organizations that base their work on him that's how I learned about what I'm going to call this collective unconscious yeah and to me that is where I'm so excited about this reading we're doing tonight yep. because I have a conscience and I have an unconscious and together we come together with all of us here with our own individual conscious, with a whole world conscious of our personal experiences that have shaped us and made us who we are today, whether we're aware of it or not. And to me, that is their unconscious. 
when we can pull all of this together, we were in a true spiritual nature where we can love each other as human beings. Mm -hmm. And we would not be in war if we could reach that across the nations. And I will say this, but each religion we've been has been fighting each other for each forever. They're gonna I, stop that. <laughs> that's the, I have left the church, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. because that's what I'm seeing. Because churches make big money, and whoever gets the biggest member, to, I love their literature, and I study all their literatures, mm-hmm. and I honor each of theirs. Now that's where, as the collective unconscious, if we can come together and bring all of our humanity to it. And that's what I learned through my teachings with Carl Young and uh, the guidelines that he has taught me to go with is to respect each other. Yeah. Okay. So for Rebecca now, um, there are, I've just put up two links here. The first one is a link to my transcript of Dr. Edward Edinger's interview with uh, Lawrence Jaffe, who Jaffe was the son of Aniela Jaffe, who did Jung's mem- memoirs. And so he wrote a book called um, uh, Liberating the Heart, in which the, the sentence appears, which says that all of Jung's work was aimed at this one thing to bring us closer to that healing power which is in the unconscious and the truth is that that's what religions do and that's what art does too for us and Mm -hmm. and we've missed the boat and so in that interview uh Jaffe asks Edinger well what does Jung's work have to do with religion and Edinger's answer is everything, everything. Mm-hmm. And uh, then the other link that I've given you just now on YouTube is a link to my lecture entitled Finding the Living God, which I gave uh, in a church setting in uh, October of 2019. And uh, you can see an, an edited version of that presentation then. Uh, okay, so uh, Jordan, would you wa- want to start uh, with part one here? Certainly, and I, I would like to say too, I really found Jung fascinated with and working with the somnambulist, which is the disorder of um, motor functions occurring while you're, you're unconscious. And about us, then typically conscious activities being performed while you're unconscious. And I think then what he's leading into that we'll see is then the simple, this is an operative way through his patients to look at how we can consciously work with the unconscious rather than a disorder of the the sleep paralysis, you know, breaks down or dissolves and people walk, I mean, or they eat or they, what have you, but physical activity. So to me, simple, simple, the sleepwalking is a great example of Jung to dial into how to consciously look at the unconscious and consciously work with the unconscious. Right. Now, um, how, um, before you, you didn't read that paragraph yet, did you? No, no, I haven't. That was just my personal comment on somnambulism okay. Okay. from his beginning intro. So Colum has given me a segue into the red book. And so I think I have to, uh, go to that for a moment and then okay. we'll let you take off here. So Colum, uh, you're talking about Jordan Peterson and uh, this is this is my favorite um, guy to be the counterpoint to because Jordan Peterson um, believes in the logos and the word and um, that's actually Freudian <laughs> and um, and so uh, a few years ago when Jordan Peterson was doing all his big tours and everything, um, he kept dropping Dr. Young's name. He kept pulling out uh, you know, pregnant quotes from Dr. Young 
all to the point that many people started to believe he's Jungian uh, and he's not Jungian. Okay, no, no matter what he, no matter what he wants to tell you, uh, maybe he can persuade me that he's changed. But um, as long as he's dependent upon the logos, uh, he uh, hasn't understood Dr. Jung's work. And uh, because Dr. Jung's work is entirely about experiential, the experiential psyche entirely. Mm -hmm. And so it's something, you know, it's like putting a nail through a bowl of jello. You can't quite nail it up to the wall because it'll slip out because we're talking about the arrow side of life, which is uh, not only where um, chaos is, but it's also where we live, okay? We mm -hmm. actually live in the arrows, not in the logos. The logos is dead. If you look at everything in your room, everything in your room is dead, except you pot, living potted plants and any pets that you have, living human beings. Um, but everything else is logos and that's all dead. Thank you, Kathy or Katie. I appreciate that. Um, and so please, uh, if you do want to go to our program, Katie, um, please do um, uh, go to the website and uh, let Tim Holmes know because he's the, the, the gatekeeper on who gets to come to the confluence. Um, and the, the website, again, is https colon slash slash confluence 22.org okay that's it okay now um so uh, anyway dr jung says it very clearly uh in his first two um paragraphs of the red book he never deviates from it you know, in 45 years of writing, he never deviates from what he says in these two paragraphs. And these are the two paragraphs which clearly establish that he's of the Eros, he is not of the Logos. And to the extent that Jordan Peterson is still married to the Logos, uh, he is not a union. Okay. And, uh, so, although, you know, Jordan Peterson, you can learn a hell of a lot from Jordan Peterson. And so I don't want to diss him too much. He's a very, he's one of the smartest people I ever saw. Um, and in terms of practical advice for living life, I'm sure he's a good um, psychotherapist and, um, and you can get a lot of good advice from Jordan. But if you want to go beyond that, to the spiritual level and to the experiential, then you have to go to Jung. And so here's what he said. Um, and it, it begins with uh, this parenthetical statement written by C.G. Jung with his own hand in his house in Kusnacht, Zurich in the year 1915. Quote, if I speak in the spirit of this time, I must say no, no one and nothing can justify what I must proclaim to you. Justification is superfluous to me since I have no choice, but I must. I have learned that in addition to the spirit of this time, there is still another spirit at work, namely that which rules the depths of everything contemporary. The spirit of this time would like to hear of use and value I also thought this way, and my humanity still thinks this way, but that other spirit forces me nevertheless to speak beyond justification, use, and meaning. Filled with human pride and blinded by the presumptuous spirit of the times, I long sought to hold that other spirit away from me, but I did not consider that the spirit of the depths from time immemorial and for all the future possesses a greater power than the spirit of this time, who changes with the generations. The spirit of the depths has subjugated all pride and arrogance to the power of judgment. He took away my belief in science, 
he re he robbed me of the joy of explaining. Remember mansplainers? <laughs> Turning the page now. He robbed me of the joy of explaining and ordering things, and he let devotion to the ideals of this time die out in me. He forced me down to the last and simplest things. The spirit of the depths took my understanding and all of my knowledge and placed them at the service of the inexplicable and the paradoxical. He robbed me of speech and writing for everything that was not in his service, namely the melting together of sense and nonsense, which produces the supreme meaning. Okay, I'll stop reading there, but the, what follows that is the supreme meaning as identified by C.G. Young. And so that was the first two paragraphs of the Red Book. If you haven't read it, get yourself a copy. Uh, there's a reader's edition. It doesn't have all the pretty pictures in it, but it's a little easier to get around with, take around with you. And um, it just is filled with wisdom. And uh, so I urge you to uh, take a look at it. And so, sorry, Jordan, I interrupted. No, no, no. In fact, actually, to, in support of how you're trying to clarify a perspective on um, on Jordan Peterson, it reminds me so much that, for example, in the movie Dead Poet Society, that scene where you would be Robin Williams, poetry yeah. <laughs> would be Carl Jung, but Jordan Peterson would be that introduction where after he has them read this polysyllabic intellectual descriptive mess of what poetry is or is not he said rip boys rip j evans richard rip rip that this is we rip 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 you know and, <laughs> and they're they're scared because they can't rip a book you know it's like yeah. that, and he's like and he walks up and he rips some for himself go ahead go ahead but it's that that intro that's that polysyllabic mess that's dry that. and but that scene that. it feels like young is poetry you're Robin Williams telling these people that this intro, Jordan Peterson, is not the poetry. And it just, it seems to make a really nice overlay. Well, Jordan Peterson can tell you a hell of a lot of logosy things about poetry. He might even point you in the direction of writing a little bit if you're, if you're very, very lucky. But, um, but Jordan Peterson is not a Jungian. Okay, that, that's what I can say unequivocally he's not i call Jungian. him i call him the Jungian disco ball because he all he does is he has all these little mirrored snippets of soundbite quotes that he blasts out but what's inside you know and young is integrated saying these things but it feels like he's the poster boy of pasting these post-it note notes on a disco ball of Jungian quotes and just however he's turning it at any given time is which one you're going to get in mind that it's it's uh, it's my dictum that uh, once something is out there, in other words, once something is out of my mouth, now it's logos. Now it's it's dead. Now it's on a video that you can watch for the next twenty five years, probably at least. Um, but but life is in here. In here, it's in the body. It's it's real life and and so all we can do with the logos is point toward where life is but we can't live it in the logos joel go ahead what's your question oh you're muted oh it, it actually parallels another comment that uh justin just no it wasn't justin that uh callum just made uh, I was introduced to uh, Jordan Peterson. Uh, let me read his Callum's thing. He said, certainly as, as how I, Peterson was my third mentor after Surrey, and I'll never get it all correct, M-O-O-J-I. Muji. Muji. Yeah. Okay, of his philosophy and Alan Watts. Uh, but after that, he started uh, learning from them to follow the union approach. And that's where I'm paralleling with someone in the audience. Yep. I uh, 
found Jordan Peterson on YouTube giving uh, webinars, not webinars, his YouTube channel showed him in, when he was younger and given uh, talks. So that's how I int got introduced to not just Carl Young, but mm -hmm. Nietzsche and everybody else. So I went backwards and started with Nietzsche. And then some of y'all let me know, I need to go back to Aristotle, Plato, so back to today. So therefore, I think Jordan Peterson is coming from, Jordan Peterson's coming from, is what you said. And for us being in this collective world conscious, we're growing and evolving. And to continue that and get out of that educational bent that's stuck in the dogma and religious dogma and can combine all of that and continue growing and learning, not getting caught in a group think. Mm. So excellent um, point. Yeah. So I just want to make sure it's clear to Katie wants to go here that since she paid five dollars to bring this to her attention, uh, that she she needs to go to the website uh, and yes. and uh, tell Tim that she wants to go. And Tim will take care of the rest. Okay. Uh, All right. Moving on. So we're going, we're starting now, right? Yeah. Part one, shall I? Yes. <laughs> I love this. Uh, well, part what one. Doing tonight. What's that? Burden? Is it the uh, YouTube group aware that we're reading the effects of the unconscious and conscious from part one of. Um, Yep, the effects of the unconscious upon consciousness, part one, the personal and the collective unconscious. So paragraph 202. Yep, paragraph 202 of volume seven of the collected works of C.G. Young. All right, go, Jordan. <laughs> and uh, I may pause to put my readers on, but my eyes just switched. My exercise may be working, so I'm going to try to read it without them. Um, in Freud's view, as most people know, the contents of the unconscious are reducible to infantile tendencies, which are repressed because of their incompatible character. Repression is a process that begins in early childhood under the moral influence of the environment and continues throughout life. By means of analysis, the repressions are removed and the repressed wishes made conscious. According to this theory, the conscious contains only those parts of the personality which could just as well be conscious and have been suppressed only through the process of education. Although from one point of view, the infantile tendencies of the unconscious are the most conspicuous, it would nonetheless be a mistake to define or evaluate the unconscious entirely in these terms. The unconscious still has another side to it. It includes not only repressed contents, but all psychic material that lies below the threshold of consciousness. It is impossible to explain the subliminal nature of all this material on the principle of repression. For in that case, the removal of repression ought to endow a person with a prodigious memory, which would thenceforth forth forget nothing. Okay, would you opine on that? Ooh. Uh, I'll, I'll let you opine on that. <laughs> well, I, I love that um, because at first he mentions that the repressions are removed so that they're no longer repressed, but then the repressed wishes are made conscious. Part of that would be acting out or being triggered or in a positive, healthy way that you've processed that. And you're able to utilize that where the loss of fear of the repression is the first part of the conscious wisdom that they can teach us. But then he goes further. And I think at the end for, in that case, the removal of repression ought to endow a person with a prodigious memory, which would thenceforth forget nothing, which means they're unthreatened and they're not worried with the moral environmental cues that caused them in the first the repressions in the first place and then in regards to forgetting nothing they use their environment as it is so that yeah. peace, peace becomes synonymous with a rhythmic dance with the present of what is rather than a lack of conflict and i think that's a nice distinction of peace 
of this forget nothing. But I wouldn't yeah. go so far as to forget nothing like someone with an eidetic or photographic memory, which forgetting nothing then typically tends to drive somebody crazy because they can't focus. Right. Well, let me um, also comment on this, that we, um, and I'll do it metaphorically. Um, all, every oak tree is an oak tree, but every oak tree is different. And that oak tree, the essence of that oak tree and what it will be in the future is in the acorn already before mm -hmm. it sprouts. Okay, the same is true of the human being. Every human being is a human being, but we're all different. Uh, and so the, what Dr. Jung is talking about is a process of energy and of energy uh, being born, maturing, uh, becoming what it is intended to be and that it dies and, and the next generation makes its contribution. And so, um, so when we start talking about repression, anything that represses from Dr. Jung's point of view is not good, okay? Ex except that obviously, you know, there's some kinds of impression a repression that, you know, we have to have in order to have civilization. For example, we have to t toilet train our children, okay, or otherwise it would be pretty ugly around the house. And, and so that's, that's a repression because we're asking them not to just do it anywhere. We're asking them to do it in the bathroom. <laughs> right? And, mm -hmm. and that's a kind of repression from the natural. But Dr. Jung's position is always in preference to, to the rational or the natural whenever possible. And so if you talked about a, a Japanese bonsai tree, that's like the ultimate repression where these art, bonsai artists are literally trimming back the, the roots and the, and the limbs of the tree in order to keep it small. Well, that's sort of the ultimate of repression. And that's, and that's you know, the opposite of nature. But, you know, people love these little trees, which are actual trees. Uh, if you took a bonsai oak tree and planted it outside your house, it would become a full-size oak tree. And in 10 years, you'd have a real oak tree out there, mm -hmm. not a bonsai oak tree. Uh, it, would, it would be in joy <laughs> because it's been cut back all the time. I appreciate uh, you bringing that up with, with the repression because... Um, Freudian repression is pretty much shame-based yes. yeah. and Jungian repression evolves into what we know as discretion and the ability to discern. So I, I would say that from a Freudian perspective, recession tends to evolve into being just more reactionary and more closeted and more um, mousy, as it were. And tiptoeing around eggshells about yourself, even whereas Jungian repression involves into discernment, which then I feel that that discernment allows you to be responsive rather than reactive. And in that sense, even silence or inaction is a form of action. And so you you are able to pace the rhythms and the pauses and the actions with discernment. Whereas with Freud, you're just trying to always avoid just the next thing that's coming down the pipe. Yeah, it would be, Freud would be spanking the baby that is still losing it in his diapers, where, whereas uh, Jung would be toilet training a baby like a dog is trained, where you put their nose in it and uh, make them realize that it isn't that desirable and maybe they ought to do something else with it. And that again, and also he instead of scolding he would probably say oh bless the boy or bless the girl and mm -hmm. you know in the, the old in the south you know oh bless bless your heart well that's mm -hmm. that's a, a way to say f you that's that's yeah. very diminishing yeah <laughs> it's not it's, it's not nice 
And, oh, they said bless my bless your heart, and I went. That's that wasn't a compliment. <laughs> well, was do kidding. you have a comment on this, please, if you want? For me, when I talk about repression, <clears throat> I could go on and on about that. But for me, uh, again, I'm going to give some kudos to Jordan Peterson. He educated me to the point that I'm here tonight. And if I got stopped at that level, that's all I would know. And by getting in the original works and with other people, then I can look at, say, my family of origin repressed as adults believing that same group think as what it was. And such as when I was talking about uh, my experience with religion, per se, I have been able to evolve, which I did before then, it just couldn't make sense to me, where I accept everybody in the world, where religion is black or white in so many things, which to mm-hmm. me is that to where we're not mature enough to accept the human race as it was born by God. And yeah, that's yeah. why I need many resources to go into. The other thing that it talked about there is that uh, below the consciousness, if I don't want to learn about anything other than a certain belief system that I am and I am trying to prove it, then that is where I am repressed. Yeah. Uh, And so that's why these things were just so pivotal to where I am. And I also think part of the repression that I wonder, and it talked about consciousness and those type of things that unconscious as we're going through this is the infantile of belief systems that have gone on for generations. Yeah. families and countries sure. and that's why these i could this whole paragraph uses words for me to go back and look at myself and acting in what ways am i acting infantile right and that's and, where, what groups am i am that i am acting infantile and when i am still acting that way and repressed i have not moved forward into the conscious of what's out there for me in the resources of today to mature, and as Carl Young is teaching me with this group and others, thank you, Skip, to individuate and become that individual mature person. Right. And that to me is a part of what I'm here about, is finding out who I am living on this planet in a big group. <laughs> well, I really appreciate your applying basically dignity and difference. In three words, dig not indifference, dignity, indifference to both yourself. And then when you say the love everyone, it's not indiscriminate. You're having dignity of difference. It's, oh, I disagree with you. So let me learn from you. Let me listen. And that I, I think that's one of the most evolved edu- self-educational development things there is, because then you're allowing yourself to not find things to repress. You're continually discovering new things that actually are. And there are, the way I found this out, if I might just skip, you know, what I would promote. <laughs> I found this out through 12-step programs. Yep. It's a worldwide program. And they said, everyone is welcome. And we won't talk about religion. And it starts off, there is a power greater than myself, which that means ego. That's mm-hmm. what somebody asked the question about ego. Ego's my way and no other way. That's what your child is. It's throwing the tantrum temper tantrum is that's where if, this is the way grandma did it if you don't get educated that's why we the, the marriage problem took place because mama always cooked the turkey in this husband wife thought about it why was it the only thing mama had we have to keep going and that's where i'm saying with jordan peter so i am where i am today and i some of y'all are going to i'll catch up with some of you and some of you are already ahead of me <laughs> So well, you know, I think that's, that's a great example because us, actually the 12 step programs historically were originated from Jungian ideas directly. If you, and, I mean, Alcoholics time. Anonymous in the early 20th century started based on Jungian psychotherapy and, but he didn't mention Jung, so there wouldn't be a conflict, which was smart, but I love the grandmother example. Cause my story along those lines is the woman who's in the kitchen and her husband says, I'm going to do the, I'm going to do the, the roast this year and I'm going to do it like your grandmother did it. And so she goes, he goes in and she looks and her mom looks and he cuts both ends off of the roast. And he, he, you know, he 
marinates it and he does the whole everything and he puts it in the oven. And when it's done, he pulls it out and they, it smells wonderful. And her mom says, why did you cut the ends off? He said, well, that's what her grandmother did. He said, she said, oh, my Lord, she did that because her oven was too small. (laughs) (laughs) It didn't make it taste any better. It wouldn't fit in the oven. And and that's where I said across the board, 12 step, it says I'm doing research and research and research. I've been to every 12 step program that I could find out why is that they're there and they all say the same thing. They're recovering, they'll name this religion or that religion. And then they'll, they'll recovering from some kind of group family thing. And the other is some of their isms is what takes them to it. And I was embarrassed to go to one step program, one of the programs because I thought, oh, if they find out blah, 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 blah. And uh, it helps you learn to live in the real world. Mm-hmm. And what did I find out? They used a different term than I did. You Mm -hmm. know, I didn't know that drunks and alcoholics were the same because I thought alcoholics were highbrow people. I found out a drunk and an alcoholic's all the same thing. (laughs) Yes. And so then I go out and I said, as I did everything else, and then I found out about all these other things that are out there, addiction, obesity, drinking, sexuality, everything's out there all on these same principles. And that's where I'm saying worldwide, Carl Young has done the 12 step program. If you want to learn it, go be a visitor. If it doesn't bother you, and if they, like I went to one AA meeting, they said, honey, you come to the meeting. I said, I I don't need it. They said, and I said, and they just looked at each other and went, I said, fine, but I went and I loved it. So, you know, I just go to anyone on the town. I will go there before I will go to a religious group. And I still will go to all of those too, because I learned so, um, everything. Joe, I, I had to close, oh, myself, close yeah. myself out for a minute because okay. I, I wanted to uh, reach this and I can't quite reach it at arm's length. So I'm going to have to move it down to my arm's length. Um, Carol Young, Alcoholics Anonymous. Okay, then I'll right. do my research. Right, well, and, and it's by uh, it's by mm-hmm. Ian McCabe, okay, published okay. by Karnak. It's a terrific book, uh, and the um, the significance of it is that that um, Jung didn't know that he was responsible for this for thirty years. Mm-hmm. He was almost dead before he found this out. I didn't know that. Well, and that goes up uh, to what you've talked about, Skip, and we're talking about the different wars that mm-hmm. uh, I was listening. Oh, you muted. Jill, you muted. I was listening to some other union groups that have been coming on this podcast, and there's a whole group out there, and it was intermixed with interracial people, and there was a focus on one particular group and po- political things. And um, and talking about his prejudice, and I thought, in the programs I go to, they say everybody can go, and that's where they were trying to take some difference on uh, according to certain their particular beliefs, and and I thought they don't know about how he was involved, from what I've been understanding. Somebody can help us behind the scenes in World War II, and. Uh, do you know that it took place and it, where they were training the Nazi uh, youth at a J-U-N such and such and such on going, it wasn't Carl Jung's family, but it was in that. And so behind the scenes, he, Carl Jung was working with the government and back at the Olympics that we were seeing lots of stuff of the older stuff on TV, whenever they got, would not allow the Jews in there I have a conspiracy theory on that. They didn't let them in and Carl Young stepped in and that's when the first blacks got in. So he's one racist. Okay, that's my theory. So I'm a Carl Young believer. Well, you know, Jill, it's interesting this this story about you know, the, what's the difference between an alcoholic and a drunk. And I remember being in church and overhearing a conversation several pew rows behind me, a little, a little girl said, mommy, that, that, that one stinks. What, what, why, why is it different? 
And she just quips up, oh, he's an, he's an alcoholic. And, and then about five minutes later, she goes, but, but, but mommy, you, you, you called that other person a drunk. What's the difference? She goes, ah, there's not much of a difference. Alcoholics just ruin more expensive clothes. <laughs> <laughs> so well, anyway. Yep. So, so since we uh, since we went so far on on Jung and AA, I think that we ought to also read this letter um, or two letters because they also are on our point. Um, Are they the ones where he finds out thirty years later? Right. So this is a a letter from Bill W. Bill Wilson. but who was always known as Bill W. until after his death, I think, Um, January 23rd, 1961. So about five months before, or actually uh, uh, just over four months before Dr. Young died. And here's what he said. My dear Dr. Jung, this letter of great appreciation has been very long overdue. May I first introduce myself as Bill W., a co-founder of the Society of Alcoholics Anonymous. Though you have surely heard of us, I doubt if you are aware that a certain conversation you once had with one of your patients, a Mr. Roland H., Uh, back in the early 1930s, did play a critical role in the founding of our fellowship. The Roland H. has long since passed away the recollection of his remarkable experience while under the treatment by you was definitely, has definitely become part of AA history. Our remembrance of Roland H.'s statements about his experience with you is as follows. Having exhausted other means of recovery from his alcoholism, it was about 1931 that he became your patient. I believe he remained under your care for perhaps a year. His admiration for you was boundless and he left you with a feeling of much confidence. To his great consternation, he soon relapsed into intoxication. Certain that you were his port of last resort, He again returned to your care, then followed followed the conversation between you that was to become the first link in the chain of events that led to to the founding of Alcoholics Anonymous. My recollection of his account of that conversation is this. First of all, you frankly told him of his hopelessness so far as any further medical or psychiatric treatment might be concerned. This candid and humble statement of yours was beyond doubt the first foundation stone upon which our society has since been built. Coming from you, one he so trusted and admired, the impact upon him was immense. When he then asked you if there was any other hope, you told him that there might be provided he could become the subject of a spiritual or religious experience. In short, a general, a genuine conversion. You pointed out how such an experience, if brought about, might remotivate him when nothing else could. But you did caution, though, that while such experiences had sometimes brought recovery to alcoholics, they were nevertheless comparatively rare. You recommended that he place himself in a religious atmosphere and hope for the best. This, I believe, was the substance of your advice. Shortly thereafter, Mr. H um, joined the Oxford groups and evangelical movement, then at the height of its success in Europe, and one with which you are doubtless, doubtless familiar. You will remember their large emphasis upon the principles of self-survey, confession, restitution, and the giving of oneself in service to others. They strongly stress meditation and prayer. In these surroundings, Roland H. did find a conversion experience that released him from, for the time being from his compulsion to drink. Returning to New York, he became very active with the uh, Oxford group here, then led by an Episcopal clergyman, Dr. Samuel Shoemaker. Dr. Shoemaker had been one of the founders of that movement and his 
and his was a powerful personality that carried immense sincerity and conviction. At this time, 1932 to 1934, the Oxford groups had already sobered a number of alcoholics and Roland, feeling that he could especially identify with these sufferers, addressed himself to the help of still others. One of these chanced to be an old schoolmate of mine named Edwin T. He had been threatened with commitment to an institution, but Mr. H and another ex-alcoholic, OG member, procured his parole and helped to bring him about, helped to bring about his sobriety. Meanwhile, I had run the course of alcoholism and was threatened with commitment myself. Fortunately, I had fallen under the care of a physician, a Dr. William D. Silkworth, who was wonderfully capable of understanding alcoholics. But just as you had given up on Roland, uh, so had he given up, had given me up. It was his theory that alcoholism had two components, an obsession with, that compelled the sufferer to drink against his will and interest, and some sort of met metabolism difficulty, which he then called an allergy. The alcoholic's compulsion guaranteed that the alcoholic's drinking would go on, and the allergy made sure that the sufferer would finally deteriorate, go insane, or die. Though I had been one of the few he had thought it possible to help, he was finally obliged to tell me uh, of my hopelessness. I, too, would have to be locked up. To me, this was a shattering blow. Just as Roland had been made ready for his conversion experience by you, so had my wonderful friend, Dr. Silkworth, prepared me. Hearing of my flight, my, my plight, my friend Edwin T. came to see me at my home where I was drinking. By then it was November, 1934. I had long marked my friend Edwin for a hopeless case. Yet here he was in a very evident state of release which could be no, by no means be accounted for by his mere association for a very short time with the Oxford groups. Yet this obvious state of release, as distinguished from the usual depression, was tremendously convincing. Because he was a kindred sufferer, he could unquestionably communicate with me at great depth. I knew at once I must find an experience like this or die. And again, I returned to Dr. Selkworth's care where I could be once more sobered and so gain a clearer view of my friend's experience of release and of Roland H.'s approach to him. Clear at once more of alcohol, I found myself terribly depressed. This served to be caused by my inability to gain the slightest faith. Edwin T. again visited me and repeated the simple Oxford group's formulas. Uh, soon after he left me, I became even more depressed. In utter despair, I cried out, quote, if there be a God, let, will he show himself, unquote. There immediately came to me an illumination of enormous impact and, and dimension something which I have since tried to describe in the book Alcoholics Anonymous and also in AA Comes of Age, basic text which I am sending to you. My release from the alcohol obsession was immediate. At once I knew I was a free man. Shortly following my experience, my friend Edwin came to the hospital bringing me a copy of William James's Varieties of Religious Experience. This book gave me the realization that most conversion experiences, whatever their variety, do have a common denominator of ego collapse at depth. The individual faces an impossible dilemma. In my case, the dilemma had been created by my compulsive drinking and the deep feeling of hopelessness had been vastly deepened by my doctor. <clears throat> it was deepened still more by my alcoholic friend when he acquainted me with your verdict of hopelessness respecting Roland H. 
in the wake of my spiritual experience, there came a vision of a society of alcoholics, each identifying with and transmitting his experiences to the next change style. <clears throat> if each sufferer were to carry the news of the scientific hopelessness of alcohol, alcoholism to each new prospect, he might be able to lay every newcomer wide open to a transforming spiritual experience. This concept proved to be the foundation of such success as Alcoholics Anonymous has since achieved. This has made conversion experiences nearly every variety reported by James available on an almost wholesale basis. Our sustained recoveries over the last quarter century number about 300,000. In America and through the world, there are today 8,000 AA groups. So to you, to Dr. Shoemaker of the Oxford groups, to William James and to my own physician, Dr. Silkworth, we of AA owe this tremendous benefaction. As you will now clearly see, this astonishing chain of events actually started long ago in your consulting room, and it was directly founded upon your own humility and deep perception. Very many, very many thoughtful AAs are students of your writings because of your conviction that man is something more than intellect, emotion, and two dollars worth of chemicals. You have especially endeared yourself to us. How our society grew, developed its traditions for unity, and structured its functioning will be seen in the texts and pamphlet material that I am sending you. <clears throat> you will also be interested to learn that in addition to the spiritual experience, many AAs report a great variety of psychic phenomena, the cumulative weight of which is very considerable. Other members have following their recovery in AA, been much helped by your practitioners. A few have been intrigued by the I Ching and your remarkable introduction to that work. Please be certain that your place in the affection and in the history of our fellowship is like no other. Gratefully yours, William G. W. So then, uh, Jung responds uh, seven days later from Kusnag, Zurich, Seestrasse 228, January 30, 1961. Mr. William G.W., Alcoholics Anonymous, Box 459, Grand Central Station, New York 17, New York. Dear Mr. Wilson, <coughs> um, Your letter has been very welcome indeed. I had no neat news from Roland H. anymore and often wondered what has, had been his fate. Our conversation, which he has adequately reported to you, had an aspect of which he did not know. The reason that I could not tell him everything was that in those days I had to be exceedingly careful of what I said. I had found out that I was misunderstood in every possible way. Thus, I was very careful when I talked to Roland H. But what I really thought about was the result of many experiences with men of his kind. His craving for alcohol was the equivalent on a low level of the spiritual thirst of our being for wholeness, expressed in medieval language, the union with God. How could one formulate such an insight in a language that is not misunderstood in our days? The only right and legitimate way to such an experience is that it happens to you in reality and it can only happen to you when you walk on a path which leads you to the higher understanding. You might be led uh, to that goal by an act of grace or through a personal or honest contact with friends or through a higher education of the mind beyond the confines of mere rationalism. I see from your letter that Roland H. has chosen the second way. 
which was under the circumstances, obviously the best one. I am strongly convinced that the evil principle prevailing in this world leads to the unrecognized spiritual need in per, into perdition if it is not counteracted either by real religious insight or by the protective wall of human community. An ordinary man, not protected by an action from above and isolated in society, cannot resist the power of evil, which is called very aptly the devil. But the use of such words arouses so many mistakes that one can only keep aloof from them as much as possible. These are the reasons why I could not give a full and sufficient explanation to Roland H., but I am risking it with you because I conclude from your very decent letter, decent and honest letter, that you have acquired a point of view above the misleading platitudes one usually hears about alcoholism. You see, alcohol in Latin is spiritus, and you use the same word for the highest religious experience as well as for the most depraving poison. The helpful formula, therefore, is spiritus contra spiritum. Uh, thanking you again for your kind letter, I remain. Yours sincerely, C.G. Young. So, um, personally, you. Yeah. for taking the schedule. Thank you very much. Thank you for yeah. reading that. There are so many good comments coming in, and I've got to say that was right on because that is yeah. the essence of the program and where I, I will tell you, um, going back to Jordan Peterson, um, I wasn't, uh, for me, I went back to school with you know, some of y'all know as an adult, and I don't know what I'm going to be in the next life. So that's going to be in the spirit realm. I think I'm going to be a neurologist today. I'm not sure tomorrow it might be epigenealogy, but uh, <laughs> epigenetics, I mean. <laughs> But uh, right, one of the other uh, podcasts I listen to, a neurologist out of Stanford has it. And um, he had a guest on there who's a psychiatrist and a physician out of Stanford. We'll let you cry while I talk and then we'll let you, but you're going to cry more when you hear what's going on. These neurologists, these yeah. people were not of the educational brand that got them into a job because their family were in that deep line of what we're talking about systems in place mm -hmm. their own podcast out there separate from the school and that's how I'm learning what I'm learning and with that there was a, a psychiatrist neurologist head of a major university speaking and talking what people talk about here in the the um the comments tonight, problems, depression, which alcohol is, which is medication, is the pharmacy, the medical institutions, what we're talking about, political, not going down that road. But in another comment, we got to take care of ourselves. And that's what I learned in program. It said, put the oxygen mask on yourself. I was too busy trying to take care of everybody else in the family. And that's what individuation comes from talked about in the church wasn't an ego talking when it said uh one was rich one was poor one smelled it was money that's what we're talking institution wise we talk about the different roles in the church male or female i live on a retreat center right now women can't be in the pulpit i didn't care when i moved here until i knew what it was like to live among them so you know who doesn't have a voice so uh <laughs> But I do with y'all to tell them about it. Don't come to Flat Rock, North Carolina, Bon Clark, and, and don't bring your church group here because I might talk to them and convert them <laughs> to 12 steps where God will let anybody, our spiritual being will let anybody in. And there's one for everybody. But back to Carl Jung, he opened a door by the people he mentored who are mm -hmm. mentoring me in the world wide. And you just presented him and the terms that are in these groups, these meetings that we're talking tonight, conscious and unconscious, they get together as a group and they have to decide on what they're going to agree upon, mm -hmm. as to how they're going to do a format. Mm -hmm. And that's how you learn to work by yourself, but you can't know that if you've been suppressed as male, female, 
whatever sex, gender, whatever with the world we've had. And that's why he's already put that program out there for us. There are 12 steps that get us to get individuated. There are 12 traditions that teach us how to work with a group. Yep. And there are 12 concepts that teach us how to work in a worldwide organization. Yep. And it's a bit no bigger than some of these texts. And if you follow that for your own personal life, you're following Carl Jung. And you just introduced it. <laughs> yeah. so, yeah. We're going to have world peace because of Skip Conover well, that's, that's, starting that's this year. <laughs> You know, that's what uh, what Edinger says in his interview. If you go back and look at the transcript that I that I put the link on the YouTube channel, um, you know, he he says that inevitably all of this will lead to world peace. Um, but, you know, he, he didn't put a time frame on it. But but, you know, the point is that we've come very much farther because Keep in mind that Jungian analysts have kept Jungian thought in a silo of their own protection for a uh, hundred years. And uh, it's only by breaking it out of the silo that we can see that, yes, Dr. Jung did penetrate to the source of all of the world's religions. Yes, what art does for you is the same thing that religion does for you. And yes, you can have the same thing done for you in a psychologist's office. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, <coughs> and that is, as, as Jaffe said in his book on page 41, that is uh, bringing you closer to the healing power and the healing power is in your own unconscious. And if you can open up that transcendent function between your conscious and your unconscious, you're going to feel so much power running through you. It's unbelievable. You know, and it, you're bringing up a silo too. The image to me came to mind that in, a, in an actionable long-term sense, the silo is that acorn. It's a concentrated power, but it's too concentrated of sameness but once it cracks open, the oak tree can grow. And well, it's, yeah. it's kind of desiccated in a way so that it's, it's kind of a rotten seed in a way. But at the same time, um, there is the potential to mine, M-I-N-E, that to juice the system or to enliven the system, to provide fuel for the quote unquote movement. I don't like that word because it equates to politics and battles and they're often the same thing. So um yeah well um let me just say that in this book, Man and the Symbols, uh Dr. Jung gave me the one paragraph that gave me the courage to do what I've been doing for the last six years. And that is because I was reading Jungian psychology for maybe 25 years before I started this uh, YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. And um, I was always very irritated. Why don't the Jungian analysts get this out into the public more? Why, why didn't they do mm -hmm. that? And, um, and, you know, I have some ideas. I mean, for, for them to do it outside of their consulting room, it's like a best friend's holiday. It's, you know, the, bus, the guy who drives the bus takes the bus to his vacation, right? Yes. <laughs> right. And so, um, so anyway, I read this paragraph from Dr. Jung, and that's, that's what gave me the courage to start what we've been doing for six years here. So... Here's what the paragraph is, As, and this is on page 101 of the, um, of the hardbound edition, and I urge you to get this edition, not the paperback edition, uh, because it has the color plates of the pictures, and many of the pictures are missing in the, in the paperback edition, but here's what Dr. Jung says, one paragraph. As any change must begin somewhere, it is the single individual who will experience it and carry it through. 
The change must indeed begin with an individual. It might be any one of us. Nobody can afford to look around and to wait for somebody else to do what he is loath to do himself. But since nobody seems to know what to do, it might be worthwhile for each of us to ask himself whether by some chance his or her unconscious may know something that will help us. Certainly the conscious mind seems unable to do anything useful in this respect. Man today is painfully aware of the fact that neither his great religions nor his various philosophies seem to provide him with those powerful animating ideas which would give him the security he needs in the face of the present condition of the world. And that skip takes us right back to what you were talking about logos, what was in our head. Right. And that goes back, are we back to that first paragraph? Are we still infantile with <laughs> not expanding ourselves into a broader awareness? And we are worldwide yes. on this today to tomorrow, whenever, because of the people in the science who kept moving forward. And, you know, and somebody mentioned the Bible, all these things that are taking place are predicted there, said where the read, uh, I think the Bible then young. And I thought that's where I said, it's the poetry, that's the art that is in there that I love to go to of any religions, because this text that we are reading from was written well, very, very long time ago. You know that better than I do. Sure. But that's where uh, what, I was talking about the professor from Sanford uh, was talking about that with the people that she was treating that had anything that anybody would go to a, a, a medical doctor and they would accept them. And she was saying it comes from trauma. It comes from fear. And if you are going to pray and ask God to help you, and that's what people were telling her, it's a lie. And so this, yeah. we're back to Carl Jung and the science and moving with the era and honoring the history and taking the spiritual part of it with us mm -hmm. and go forward. And yeah. so, yeah, Mila says, I've often wondered if people who say they use substances to experience out of body or euphoria would have the same or similar experience if they had meditated. And I would say that um, you're, you're taking a risk with your life if you do that. And in, on this YouTube channel, we never we recommend do. that. You know, I do yeah. note that Johns Hopkins is experimenting with psychedelic drugs under doctor's supervision, but it's like one or two trips. It's not, it's not, something that you do every weekend to blow off steam type thing, right? And, um, and it's done under doctor's supervision and under doctor's aid. Anything else, people, you know, if you're, if you're gonna get some sort of psychedelic drug off the street, wow, uh, you know, what, what is it? What is that substance you're being given there? You, you know, sure? I would like to contribute that yeah, to sure. me, the drugs, the alcohol are not causing an out of body experience. And I, I would contribute that what if you've ever done holotropic breathing, martial arts to the point where you're to failure physically, where the mind forgets and the body remembers and you cannot move anymore. Mm -hmm. um, there are different places you reach that are numinous. But I think that the, it's not out of body with chemicals. I think it's out of your normal, miserable experience. And so it's a numbing and a break from those things you're in denial of. And what's interesting is the old adage of you can't fill a closed heart. You can't fill a closed vessel. And the thing is, a friend of mine, I remember telling um, his girlfriend, it's like, honey, sorrows are really damn good swimmers. And they're gonna they're gonna chatter and cackle at you from the bottom of every one of those bottles. And he, er, the more you go, the more tired you'll be, and the more loud their laughter will be, and then the more you'll try to cycle, cycle. But um, I think that what I've noticed is there's a, a numbing with people that they consider it out of body, 
but they haven't done creative work or their own professional work with such a discipline of the ritual that they reached a higher level there to understand the difference between what's numinous and what's simply not miserable um, and having a break from that. So I, I, I don't have any facts. That's, that's, you know, that's all anecdotal, but from my experience and also with clients um, minding to present that there is a distinction between bright numinous experiences and simply a rest from your trouble um, or literally to arrest your trouble. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there. Yeah. I'd like to add to Go that, ahead. Chip. I didn't grow up doing drugs or alcohol. I was too scared. <laughs> Still haven't. I did drink six hard ciders this past year. In mm. 2021, I did. Mm-hmm. I did. And I. Um, well, I'm glad you're safe from that. <laughs> anyway, but I have had an out of body experience. And this goes right. back to what we're okay. talking about here mm -hmm. is the unconscious and the conscious. And I had talked with a counselor about it. And I, I had forgotten about one of these unconscious things. And I remember the age I was, and I was living in a traumatic experience. Mm -hmm. And I said, there was a lot of stuff going on and my body just left it. And I can't tell you what was going on after that, but I was up on the ceiling and I was floating around and I was looking at everybody. So I've had an out of body experience, but because of that, I can fix walls and paint and so, and so I'm still learning. I took the bad and made good. Yeah, absolutely. Nice. Yeah. yeah. And so when you're, I'm now with artists is what's drawing me to this now. Yeah. And that art, and when I see the art now, I see it so differently. And that's where the religious buildings are so amazing. All the beautiful, and that's where I see God in them, whoever their God is. So yeah. that's back to what Carl Jung and all this writing does to me, is it ties the world together and what's in common. Yeah, well, I do have frequent numinous experiences, as many of you know, but uh, last week I saved a young woman from a traumatic experience. And uh, when I did that, um, it involved a 800 round, mile round trip drive. Uh, and I think it's probably the farthest I've ever drawn, driven by myself without ever having a break, uh, except for bathroom breaks. And um, after we were... I had safely extracted her from her situation. And when we were back at my house, she said, you know, it was like time stopped. And, and mm -hmm. I really felt the same way. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, I did have a little caffeine. I took, I drank coffee, but, um, but, uh, you know, it was like, like, uh, I can't tell you all of it in this public forum, but, um, we were actually in the car with th three other people who were on a video chat with this young woman and the other three people were in other countries let me say that and for the entire seven hours they were live in her hand and the and they were constantly chatting uh, in a tremendous uh, example of participation mystique where it was like being in the car with a flock of magpies. Mm -hmm. Incredible. But, yeah. and, uh, but um, I never got, um, I never felt sleepy at all during this trip which lasted from 11 in the morning till three o'clock the next morning um 
you know, it's just, it was an amazing numinous experience. Um, and especially the trip back, which was when time stopped for us uh, for that period. It was just incredible. Um, well, you know, your concept of the time stopping really resonates because it never happened when I was doing watercolors. It was a different subtle feel, but with the oils, it was darker. And I used to always say, well, there's a point when I'm banging on the canvas with my hands with the gloves and time dilates like it just opened up like you had your eyes dilated and the concept of that moment and the next moment is gone yeah basically you dropped in it's like scuba diving where you know you said time stopped it, it went it goes away yeah i i remember another time that was especially like this and it was um i was visiting my parents and um i didn't know why but we've always we always had uh photographs of the two of them on on the wall of their home when when they were my mother was 20 and my father was 24 and they were quite lovely at that age as you can imagine and i was getting into portrait painting so i said uh, mom i'm gonna try to paint your portrait from these photographs. Um, and it was a, at a time when I was trying to do it by making a very serious uh, grid, grid lines, okay, quarter inch grid lines where um, I could estimate, okay, in this quarter inch, I should be doing this and so on very, um, very pedantically. And I started to do it and at about 1030 at night, I, I guess I started about eight, but at about 1030 at night, all of a sudden I did enter the space again also. And after that, this unconscious power took over and I, I did these two paintings that night. And, um, and I, I was just doing them with colored pencil. You know, it wasn't fancy paint or anything like that. I just did them with colored pencil. But when my mother came down in the morning, um, she looked at them kind of shocked. And that morning insisted on going buying frames for them. And she replaced the, the photographs on the wall with these two paintings that I did. And, and that's mm -hmm. what was on the wall for the rest of their lives. And, uh, you know, it's not nice. that I'm such a wonderful artist, but uh, my mother was so moved by it that she just wanted that instead of the photographs. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and she put them on the wall not the fridge that's yeah. a distinction of artwork <laughs> yeah that's right uh and actually replaced the photographs and and you know mm -hmm. i don't i don't know if you're an appreciator of, of uh, oil paintings and particularly oil paintings photo uh, portraits but you know the reality is once you see a oil painting of someone you can't look at a photograph you know you don't you don't see what what you can see in an oil painting well, the oceans the depth of the flow of the water of the paint that de you know as they rise and fall and crest and texture whether it be you know spatula brush or pulls with the fingers i mean it, you get you you literally can ride the painting like you're in a boat I mean, when you're up close and, and immerse yourself, I literally, the whole liquid metaphor of immerse yourself and so feel Amela, it. Amela says there are also shamans who use substances and claim to reach a higher power or for rituals such as divination or communication yeah. with spirits uh, and walk through portals and mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, you know, sure there are, and sure they help those people in certain ways. I don't think it's for everyone. And I, I think it, it's 
if if you're going to start doing that kind of thing, you you need to do it with someone who knows what they're doing. And who yeah, and those are those are legitimate because they understand the difference between a, a numbing denial yes. and an actual mystical or numinous experience, and they can use these things. And that's the thing you. When they say like with ayahuasca, et cetera, Mm -hmm. you need a good guide. The reason is you have a guide and it's not a doping mechanism like in sports where, you know, adrenaline or endorphins or any kind of uh, other opioids or anything. I mean, the steroids, I mean, um, it's, it's, it's different. And I mean, it's even, I mean, the plant ayahuasca, it's from nature. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember hearing a comedian, it's like, How do they make marijuana illegal? It grows in the dirt. You know, it's like, so it's the kind of thing where you're right. I think that there is, it's not for everyone, but there is a distinction, I think, with with legitimate shamans who understand the power and intensity of where they're going to take people. And it's not just a, you know, flash in the pan, one shot gig. They they allow them to immerse themselves in the experience but not just go, oh, wow, my mind was blown. It's like, no, 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 you're not that superficial. There's more to it. Yeah. And, you know, what they're ahead. talking about there in the comments and they're talking about is when they do introduce them to something, it's for a purpose. Uh, sometimes illnesses with the shamans, if they're introducing them, a, taking care of, uh, to heal something, I'm going to say, and I'm going to jump to present day with the pharmaceutical because another thing came in about you know president people you couldn't go take full-time you know unit industry with random drug test but that the you know right now marijuana is one of the things that's being argued in the united states and who's buying up the land and who's buying up the stuff to do it the big pharma i just want to grow up in my backyard you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, I, actually, I haven't tried that but what I'm doing is I know somebody who's offered me some brownies and they say it's really good and they said can you just bring me a plant and that's mm-hmm. where if you do something for medicinal purpose but that takes us so big and worldwide and, yeah. and back to what you said the shamans provided to the spirit and the body so um uh, Sahir, uh, salam alaikum. Uh, I'm trying to admit you as a panelist, but now I see you've de- declined to join us as a panelist. If you want to say anything on the chat, you're certainly welcome to uh, join us. Um, but uh, you'll just have to bring my attention to it now because I, I've uh, tried three times and you've declined. So anyway, you're welcome here as, a, as an attendee or you're welcome to attend on uh, YouTube as well. Um, I think that segues us into that next paragraph that actually will, I think, generally speak about most of all of what we've been discussing. Okay, that's 204. 204, yes. You want to do it? Sure. We therefore emphatically emphatically affirm that in addition to the repressed material, the unconscious contains all those psychic components that have fallen below the threshold, as well as the subliminal sense perceptions. Moreover, we know from abundant experience, as well as for theoretical reasons, that the unconscious also contains the material that has not yet reached the threshold of consciousness. These are the seeds of future conscious contents. Equally, we have reason to suppose that the unconscious is never quiescent in the sense of being inactive, but is, it is ceaselessly engaged in grouping and regrouping its contents. This activity should be thought of as completely autonomous, only in pathological cases. Normally, it is coordinated with a conscious mind in a compensatory relationship. Yeah. So let me just mention to Sahir, he's saying that he would le- be, like to be part of the discussion. Sahir, if you're, I think if you just speak out and unmute your system, um, we will be able to hear you whether or not you want to show your face. Uh, but otherwise, I will 
invite you one more time to join us and uh, you know if you can get on great um, all right uh, carry on uh, I wasn't paying much attention. shall I shall I continue the reading yeah, yeah certainly. next paragraph it, <laughs> it is to be assumed that all these contents are of a personal nature insofar as they are acquired during the individual's life since this life is limited, the number of acquired contents in the unconscious must also be limited. This being so, it might be thought possible to empty the unconscious, either by analysis or by making a complete inventory of the unconscious contents on the ground that the unconscious cannot produce anything more than what is already known and assimilated into consciousness. We should also have to suppose, as already said, <coughs> that if one could arrest the descent of conscious contents into the unconscious by doing away with repression, unconscious productivity would be paralyzed. This is possible only to a very limited extent as we know from experience. We urge our patients to hold fast to repressed contents that have been reassociated with consciousness and to assimilate them into their plan of life. But this procedure, as we may daily convince ourselves, makes no impression on the unconscious, since it calmly goes on producing dreams and fantasies, which according to Freud's original theory, must arise from personal repressions. If in such cases, we pursue our observations systematically and without prejudice, we shall find material which, although similar in form to the previous personal contents, yet seems to contain illusions that go far beyond the personal sphere. Mm. Yeah. How spiritual. <laughs> you wanna comment on that? And uh, Sahir, you're certainly welcome to unmute your, your uh, mic and, and speak up if you have something you wanna say. Well, the very end seems to be introducing that concept of the collective unconscious mm -hmm. in relation to, or wait, the collective unconscious or the collective collective consciousness? <laughs> yeah, because it said that go far beyond the personal sphere. Yeah, exactly. that's 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 directly <laughs> alluding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She's on but it, it is an identification. You're welcome. It seems like. I meet you, all of you. Um, Dr. Sehel Masood from India. Oh, hi. How are you, Saha? I'm good. I'm good. How are you all doing? We're well. Good. Thank you. It's so nice to be a part of this. Uh, Carl Jung has always been uh, something that I was very fascinated with. Mm -hmm. as a psychologist and off late I mean I just recently read uh, Jung's map of the soul and that really intrigued me hence I joined the channel and I wanted to be part of the discussion yeah so, terrific well we're, yeah. we're we're delighted to uh, have you here uh, you probably don't know that I've made 44 trips to India since 1990 <laughs> oh, that's or no, incredible. since 19, uh, yeah, since 1990. And uh, uh, so I've, I've got a lot of experience with India. Um, all right. And um, so tell us a little bit about yourself. So I'm uh, a psychologist. I'm a counseling mm -hmm. psychologist. I have a PhD in psychology. Mm -hmm. And I work with clients. I have my own uh, private practice in India. I've been working with various hospitals and social services also. And currently I'm writing a book, so. Oh, terrific. What's the, the topic of the book? The topic is actually, I'm writing as an industrial psychologist. So my PhD is actually with industrial psychology. Uh -huh. So it's on uh, organizational commitment behavior in private organizations. Terrific. Um, nice. <clears throat> well, we, we have some other sessions that might uh, suit you be better on time because right now I know that it's very early in the morning. Um, yeah. Hey, what, what city are you near? I am near New Delhi. Delhi, okay. Um, yeah. Well, we, um, Jordan and I do a session on Sunday mornings 
uh, starting at 9 U.S. Eastern time, which would be about 4.30 uh, your time on, uh, okay. on Sunday afternoon, your time, we do that and love to have you then. And we also have an advanced breeding group uh, on uh, Wednesdays at one o'clock, uh, which would be 1030 at night your time, but you might want to hear, right. hear that because, uh, you know, there we're discussing more advanced topics. So, um, and currently the anatomy of the psyche by Edward Edinger. Right which yeah. goes well with the map of the soul. I mean, right. And so I'm just going to get the, the link for our, um, for our uh, MailChimp so that you can be a part of our, um, so that you can get notices of our various sessions. Cause we also uh, do, um, uh, we, we do what we call wisdom path sessions where we invite uh, authors. And, um, and so I just put it on the chat for you. That's the link to the MailChimp uh, sign up. And that, that way you can get all of our notices and not miss anything. Uh, I think the most popular one we did happened to be on Map of the Soul that, that uh, uh, Mary Stein, um, well, he, it, it was because BTS, the, the Korean boy band, had done uh, two um, albums on Carl Jung's work, which are extremely impressive. If you haven't seen it, you seen those, the, the, uh, the videos are quite impressive. Um, but it was all based on Murray Stein's Map of the Soul, uh, an introduction, that book. And, um, and so uh, you might enjoy finding those because they're the ones, um, it's their manager who's now gotten Jung out to the world to a new generation, really, because there, there are 20 Jungian oriented songs on those two albums. It's just really phenomenal. Um, but anyway, so it's lovely to, to meet you. And of course, you're welcome here any Monday, or it'll be Tuesday morning for you. But if you don't mind getting up at 5 30 in the morning, you're certainly welcome. <laughs> you're absolutely right about the timing. Yes. But it's such an honor to be here. Uh, to hear this discussion it's just like you know I'm learning so much through you people and Perfect. it's yes thank you so much well glad to have you here too especially from an industrial psychology scale because that adds a, a different layer than what we've done with you know normal psychoanalysis and professionals that have been on to contribute so that's that's quite a joy to have that because that's kind of rare um I think from my perspective, since I've been in the group a, a while, that to have someone who has that background, which is it's similar, but it's a different scale and it, it plays a different, almost going to have different perspectives. So welcome. Yeah. Thank and, you. Uh, and just for, um, for reference, I just put on a link to our confluence in the summer. You might want to think of a trip to the United States in June uh, because we're going to have an amazing uh, meeting in June. I, I just recommend that you click on that link and, and take a look at that website. You'll see what I mean. Um, okay, I will. I will. It would be Thank great you. to have someone like you attend uh, if you would be interested. And uh, Deanna D here says hello to you. Do you, do you know Deanna? Deanna D says hello, Sather. Uh, anyway. Okay, well, it is 9.59 and I think I can't do what I used to do. I used to let these things go on for an extra hour and a half or something <laughs> like that. But I think that's now behind beyond me. So uh, I remember one night we looked down and went, oh my, we're almost at four hours. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, we just happened to all pause at one time and then, oh, 
um, it's time to get up. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah. So I, I think for tonight, I'm going to call this to an end and we'll wish uh, Annabelle a safe travels to Iceland. That's to Iceland. Thank you very much. Uh, Enjoy. I've, I've often wanted to go and um, it so happens that the, that the military has, um, has bases in Iceland. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so the various military flights, sometimes people like me who are retired military can get a free uh, passage to Iceland. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, usually out of McGuire Air Force Base, but uh, anyway. Uh, well, they have a beautiful opera house there, and they were supposed mm -hmm. to be doing a production of the Valkyries of Wagner. Oh, wow. Yeah, but because of coronavirus, it seems to be postponed. Um, that was a very sad thing to realize. Mm -hmm. We weren't going to be able to attend that because they're yeah. very old fashioned, you know, sort of European with their long tailed tuxedos and stiff oh, colors yeah. and you know, very, a lot of formality and it's a very beautiful architectural, striking architectural, um, you know, example, the Harpa mm -hmm. um, Opera House. Like, well, like sometimes Sydney, they're boundaries. Like Sydney, between... it's on the water and it, yeah. or it's in a boomerang shape, theirs. Um, so it's also just a striking presence and has a relationship with the harbor. Well, you know, in Iceland too, with the, the long tails and the brooches and the hats yes. and the, the period, sometimes you don't see a line. There's no property line between the audience and the stage, depending yeah. on what they're performing. And it's kind of interesting that you're all you're all in that sense swimming in the same space. Yeah. While the performance is going on. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, that won't happen, but. But yeah. maybe skip when you plan, when you do make some plan to go, try to go there when you can see Wagner. They love yeah. Wagner, of course. <laughs> yeah, that would, that would be great. I'd love to see the ride of the Valkyries live sometime. Live uh, up near the Arctic Circle. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I won't be looking for any gold maidens in the river there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good, uh, so good night Amila we're all, all going to sign off and wish uh, Annabelle a safe travels and thank you so much uh, Sahar, I, I hope you will join us again and uh, mm -hmm. I hope you've followed these links so that uh, you can find us and, and receive our notices uh, when we meet so. Yeah, I have. I have. Lovely meeting you all. Have a safe trip, Annabelle. And thank you, Skip. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, uh, thank you Jordan. You're welcome. And Jewel, thank you for putting me up to um, uh, reading from the book about the establishment of AA, because uh, I think that that's a, a story that is not widely known. And yeah. I'm, I'm glad mm -hmm. to put it. I'm glad to put it on the recording here so that others and, can be aware of it. And that was no arabesque. I mean, that that put in a nice woven loop since I know Annabelle's sewing there and Jewel, you talked These about sewing. These are the sewing. beading, beading from my beading. eyes, tiny holes. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> well, it's like you, your beading for the eyes inspired me to get back to my nighttime darkness, like seeing in the dark exercises to strengthen my Very light. Good. And I laughed that I got through three paragraphs Wonderful. not like way out here but and i'm like wow it's it's clear again of yeah. course it's better with the readers but i'm like you know do what i can but so yeah okay so for those of you who are in the advanced reading group i will see you on wednesday and i'm going to take a uh, well-earned day off tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> okay. i i found i found that my uh my silver oh. armor is a little tarnished and the oh. and, and the steed is a bit broken down. <laughs> and uh, I feel Just, more you know. like uh, Don Quixote than <laughs> during my adventure last week. Nice. It was quite an adventure too, but yeah, someday the, the story may be told.
with the names changed to protect the guilty. Good idea. <laughs> 